Hello, and welcome to the Sunbloom Conversations, a series of conversations from around the world inspired by the censorship on social media of an image of a breastfeeding mother that we're going to paint on a three-story wall in Bristol, UK instead. I'm Claire Tchaikovsky, the founder of Human Milk, an award-winning clothing brand and global education movement that supports the well-being of women and their families by communicating the science of human milk and breastfeeding. Today, I'm talking with Dr. Emma Noble about the need for more breastfeeding knowledge in healthcare professions and the power of both individual stories and big scale thinking when it comes to supporting mothers and their families. Welcome, Dr. Emma Noble in Canada. I'm in Victoria, BC. So on the West Coast, Vancouver Island at the very southern tip is Victoria. I guess my qualifications would be a family physician, board certified lactation consultant as well, um, and a member of the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine. So that international organization that um, some listeners may be familiar with. Yeah, it's great to find a a tribe of um, healthcare providers that are also really passionate and to be part of that group as well. So amazing. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, We've had a few conversations and you are quite passionate about um well breastfeeding in general and also the the mural project and so we're going to be chatting about your perspective on things because I think a lot of uh women mothers who encounter issues or, or breastfeeding mothers are as as a whole and I'm speaking now as, as just a, as a mother we're often quite surprised by the lack of knowledge in the doctors that surround us um and the healthcare professionals that we turn to are you um are you surprised by this is it a is it also a uk thing is it the same in canada yeah i think it's probably global um from what i understand from colleagues having gone through and just reflecting on my medical training so little information um about infant feeding and breastfeeding and even how you know the physiology how our body makes breast milk that barely comes up in the four years we have in medical school Um, this is something that I pretty much had to pursue independently um, during my residency so those two years that you spend after medical school um, specializing in whatever whatever area of medicine you're you're interested in so family practice and I did all my electives in maternity care and breastfeeding and Yeah, and so I really soaked up everything that I could after the standard curriculum was through. Um, So I'm not I'm not surprised that a lot of healthcare providers feel like they don't have a lot of information. Um, And it's not surprising then to hear from patients that they have never really had a conversation with their maternity care provider about breastfeeding. And the first time they really start to talk about it is when their baby isn't gaining weight or their milk production is low and they have no idea why. Um, And then it really sort of hits people like a ton of bricks. Like, I thought this was just gonna be easy. What's going on? Um, Yeah. Yeah, we do. We come to it in a state of emergency, don't we? It's um, a a kind of curative rather than a preventative approach where we know about our own bodies in advance and we know what to expect and um why do you think that is and why do you think there is so little on the topic given how important it is in medical studies why why, what's your thought on that Mm -hmm. well I think there's a few reasons and the the things that come to mind are that there really isn't a, a as you know well there isn't a plethora of research on the topic right there's there is a lot but it isn't that sort of easy to digest and regurgitate um, evidence-based source, you know, literature that um, a lot of physicians in particular really feel they need to have in order to speak uh, with some authority on a particular topic. So I think that, that there's a piece of that is not enough evidence to really inform people's discussion about it. Um, But I think the reason for that is that it hasn't been made a priority, right? This is a women's issue. So if we get into gender inequality, then I think this is, this is a women's issue. Um, And it's, there's so many levels and within that. Um, So I do think the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine does a lovely job though of, 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 pooling all the research that's available and and sifting through it in 
great detail really um, to develop their protocol. So if, you know, that is the protocols developed by the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine are such a wonderful resource for healthcare providers. And I, I think if you're not a member, you don't necessarily know that you're able to access those. Um, but that is one source that I would love to just sort of get out there and, and to teach some of my colleagues about, you know, this is a wonderful evidence-based resource to support families with a whole variety of infant feeding challenges and breastfeeding challenges. Um, because I think once people can latch onto that, pardon the pun, um, then they feel more confident having these discussions with families. And, and that's important. You know, I think it, I'm just reflecting on a without giving any identifying information, I have a few physician patients um, in my practice and it's, it's always fascinating to, to hear their comments as they come into my space, having experienced firsthand low milk production. And, uh, and then we start to have a discussion and I take a detailed history and then um, we come up with a plan. And, and it's really, you know, it's really interesting how many times from these patients I've heard like, I didn't know any of that. How did I not know any of that? Like, how am I a practicing family doctor, maternity care provider, and I didn't know any of that. And I've been counseling people about breastfeeding for years. So yeah, there's a lot of work to do. And I think I don't wanna be negative. I'd love to focus on how can we make this a more positive experience for everybody? How can we empower families first and foremost? And then how can we empower the whole community of support around those families to make it a more positive experience for everybody? Um, so yeah, it's been, it's an interesting journey, all these different facets to breastfeeding and supporting families and, and learning as a professional and as a colleague. How did you actually come to uh, be, become interested in, in, in the topic then since it, it wasn't something you kind of knew much about and then medical school didn't really touch on it? What drew you to it? Yeah, I think a few things. It sort of feels like the it's a perfect mixture of things for me because I have always been quite passionate about um, women's rights and um and also infant feeding because my background is in nutrition. So I was a dietitian before going into medicine. Um, so as I went through my medical training, um, I, you know, the, the incredible experience of witnessing birth just totally grabbed me. And I became really, really interested in that whole process of, of supporting women through their pregnancy and in that intense and beautiful moment of delivery. And then from that point forward, um, how they nurture and feed their babies. Um, so it, it seemed like this lovely mixture of nutrition and women's rights and empowering women. Um, breastfeeding is just sort of where it all comes together for me. And then personally, having had breastfeeding challenges with my first son in 2013, um, he had a cow's milk protein allergy and at about three months, I was told by the pediatrician and the pediatric allergist to, to feed him formula. And, um, and I wasn't really given much information about any alternative, but I knew I wasn't going to do that. <laughs> so I started digging and doing my own research and realized, you know, if I just eliminate it from my own diet, then he's not getting exposed to cow's milk protein through my breast milk. And we went on to breastfeed for two years and he was fine. So um, yeah, it's a few things that have led me to it. But as I've gotten more and more informed and um, engaged in it, I just can't stop. You know, like it's, it's my love. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I wish I could stop. <laughs> but, then I just get cross again and go, no, I can't. Yeah. I don't want to go back and go, and another thing. <laughs> just, yeah. It is, it is such a beautiful, profound and, and sort of primal space, isn't it? Um, mm -hmm. And I, it's, a, it's um, I think a very vulnerable space because I just, you know, everything around birth is so vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's a, important that we protect that space because it is quite easy to interrupt. It's quite easy to come into that space and um, in a, in a, 
uh, a place of doubt. A lot of new parents are in a place of doubt and exhaustion and just wanting to, you know, this little tiny baby to be okay. Yeah, survive. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, very primal. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I watched our son, you know, my, my partner was carrying him out of the hospital and I was just, just walking just next to them through the, and I just thought, oh, it just, I just had this dawning of, I have to keep that human alive. Mm -hmm. And that's what I, and I, I, I felt this wash of dread, honestly. Mm -hmm. It's just <laughs> it's huge. Yeah, it's huge. And and all the hormonal changes that are happening in that early postpartum period make women even more vulnerable. You know, I think it, it is a very fragile, beautifully delicate time. And um, yeah, and I love, you know, that we as a community, um, we can really we can make a difference if we support these young families. And that's, I think that is a huge motivator for me because I see that individual, that's, that's my interaction mostly at this point, right? Is one-on-one -on -one with families. So I'm in a room with a family for 45 minutes to an hour in these early moments postpartum. And typically they come to me when they're already having some challenges, you know, nipple pain, difficulty latching, baby's not gaining weight well, low milk production, whatever the case is. Um, but it's this incredible opportunity to connect and just acknowledge just how much is going on for these people and, and how strong that, that drive is to care for this little human. Um, and sometimes I feel like people really just let out a sigh of relief when you acknowledge like, doesn't this just feel so intense? Yeah. All you wanna do is help this little baby survive and it seems so difficult. Um, so yeah, I love those moments and connecting in that way with my patients and then shifting into a place where, you know, by the time they walk out the door, they're feeling empowered and they, they know they can do it. They have support and they have now got the information they need and they're, it's going to be okay. You know, it's going to be okay. <laughs> so absolutely, absolutely. What a, what a, um, well, what a, what a beautiful thing you do. Um, you know, it's, I, I don't have any experience of that at all. I came to this as a mother. I'm not, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a scientist. I'm not in that field at all. So really I, I, I came to this as a, as a mother and I've learned so much from, from people like yourself. And, uh, but I don't, I don't have that one-to-one um, -one interaction um, experience. So I talk to a lot of people who do and follow a lot of people who do so, but um very very special and obviously what 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 I do as human milk would be pretty pointless without people like you physically on the ground with women uh and 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 it really is just a piece of the puzzle you know what 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 we do is just is just a piece of the puzzle that I hope is useful that's that's kind of but it's interesting that you mentioned an interest in bringing this onto a, a sort of is it, I'm understanding correctly a sort of wider scale where you are in a one-to-one -one situation, you see all these amazing things happening, and it sounds like you have a drive to tell more people or, or reach. A, is, is that? Um... Yeah, absolutely. I think I'm I'm kind of growing into that more and getting clearer about what that might look like. Where it's sort of the next step for me is is doing more prenatal education, because I've just heard the story too many times now. Um, and pre-pandemic, I used to do group medical visits that focused on the prenatal population and having discussions around breastfeeding before that baby was in the mother's arms so that they could feel more empowered on their infant feeding journey. And then the pandemic brought group visits to a quick end, um, but I'm just getting them up and going again. And I think for me right now, focusing on prenatal education, having these conversations, just chatting with people about... so. Who are your support people? You know, when when baby arrives, who's going to help you with dishes and laundry and grocery shopping and and just starting those conversations and then having a little bit more of a detailed discussion about how do, what is a latch? How do you latch a baby? What does a good latch feel like? And busting some of those myths around breastfeeding that a lot of people come into these group visits with. I love that too. Just like tell me what you've heard. Let's talk about it and and uh, and take it from there. So. 
Yeah, I think connecting prenatally and empowering people at that stage of parenthood and motherhood is, is key to a more positive infant feeding, breastfeeding experience for all families. Um, it means they can advocate for themselves early, right? It means they can advocate for themselves while they're on the postpartum unit and it's been six hours and they haven't breastfed yet. Um, I hope that after a prenatal education session, they, they know to just ring the bell and ask for help and have someone come and take a look and, and get that early support that's so important for establishing breastfeeding. So o over here, the stats are pretty, uh, well, harrowing, really, in the first six weeks, mm -hmm. around 50%, there's a 50% drop off, mm -hmm. and something like eight to nine um, out of 10 women say that they didn't actually want to stop, but they just couldn't make it work and couldn't find where to go to, to, to get the help. Mm -hmm. So that's a, ha that's a pretty harrowing situation. Yeah. Um, what is, is it? Are we talking similar situation where you where you are or? I used to know these numbers and in this mm. moment, I actually don't feel like I know them confidently. Yeah. Uh, but it is. That was from 2010, I think over here because the infant feeding survey um, that happened every five years was canceled because, you know, not important enough. Um, I understand it's starting again next year though. It will be the first in 13 years. So it'd be very interesting to see where we're at. Yeah. yeah. But, um, yeah so, like, so just a big drop off as well then. Yeah. And I think for similar reasons, you know, like this, this, the lack of support um, and, and then not knowing, you know, just really not having the information to be empowered to eat, to even ask for help, right? Where do you turn? And if you know where to turn, what do you ask for? Um, so if people can feel empowered and, and informed and educated before they enter that fragile stage postpartum, I do think, I really think it will make a difference. And I've seen it make a difference at a very small scale with individual families. Um, and I just love those, those stories so much. Um, but there was something else that's coming to me, Claire, and it's about how I really feel like what I do isn't that special at all. You know, like it's really meaningful to me. I, I, I feel like at an individual level with a patient or a client, it, it makes a difference. But I, I actually don't think I'm doing anything fancy or particularly <laughs> magical um, and just making time to have these conversations and and informing myself so that I can provide patients with basic information really and so I this is what gives me hope right I, th I think that this can go big because it, it isn't actually that difficult um, it's really quite basic um, and I'm not trying to minimize it in any way, I just think um, anybody who cares can do this. And wouldn't it be lovely if we could help a lot more support people and care providers um, get excited about it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what, what do you think needs to happen for that to unfold? Mm -hmm. I think, you know, thinking about the healthcare sector specifically I think people need to get that information during their training I also think they need to get the exposure more frequently throughout the training and I think they need to hear from the stories from families they need to hear the patient voices right they need to hear almost to follow a family through their journey right like here is the family doing their prenatal piece and and here they are in those early moments postpartum and now six months and this baby's been exclusively breastfed and the mom's been loving it you know like it's been a really positive journey and maybe you contrast that with something that doesn't go quite so well um, I think that would make a difference I think giving people you know dedicating time within medical training to this topic is important um, and then giving people the the clinical experience um, and also helping them get a sense of just how significant the impact can be. Yeah, that, that was when, when I started Human Milk, it was exactly that was the, the thought behind it. I was thinking, so there are all these stats, there are these, it's highly emotive, but what's underneath, what's the, what's sort of the, the bottom line belief 
uh, I think things unfold because of belief systems and, and what you know what what's the sort of the, the, the most basic belief that I can identify that means that people don't get why this matters and I just thought I think most people believe that there's it just doesn't there's no difference between breast milk, breast milk and the alternatives and if you don't think there is any significant difference why would you persevere why would you so it's a really really well rooted belief mm -hmm. and just sort of discovering even just the just the contents of the milk never mind almost what that content does you know because mm -hmm. it's just it's mind-blowing and it's it's for me it was um it was a it was a, it was a it was a case of justice i i want i wanted this information and mm. once i had it i had it way, way after my son was sort of one and a half but f thankfully he was still feeding and you know we didn't have those those, those problems but when i learned it i got so angry that mm. i didn't know this mm. that nobody had told me and that i couldn't see anybody else telling anybody else and i felt really strongly about that mm -hmm. um, yeah and I'm so, I mean I'm sorry that it was a frustrating experience in some ways but in other ways I'm just so thankful that you know you got fired up because it is things like this it is the work you're doing that also makes a huge difference at a, a higher level right um, and that's what I, I think I mean when there's multiple layers we need to multiple level, levels we need to work at um, it's on the ground one-on-one -on -one, and it's also at the level of human milk and getting information out there and awareness campaigns and um, really good quality visuals about the contents of breast milk like it's so important and then policy level you know as well um, so I just want to say thank you for doing this work Claire like I'm so inspired by what you're doing and I I'm just like it just warms my heart every day to think about it and all the other people dedicated to to this project just on your team alone um yeah it really makes me hopeful that together we can all make it better wow well thank you for saying that i am um, i still feel like an imposter eight years later as to i still kind of go what do i know i'm sitting with someone like you and i'm like oh my goodness you you you're a doctor you know all these things who are you know so i yeah it's 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 um i'm i'm feeling really uh, happy about meeting with you and uh, i feel good things good things are coming mm -hmm. um this so sunbloom was really the that's where we connected over email i think you you um ordered a scarf and I needed your phone number or something so it was really serendipitous where there was a, a, a slight issue with the delivery and um we got to chatting and um uh so this the re the reason I think Sunbloom is this or this project is so important is exactly what you said if we don't see these things in advance then we don't know we don't know what's ahead of us we we, we get there it's kind of late in the day if someone's lucky enough to know where to go and to have someone available like you who can sit with them give them that space give them that knowledge then fantastic but a lot of women don't have that or don't know where to go even I mean um so if we don't see um just even the imagery bringing to mind that oh that's a thing it's just, it's as basic as that it's what you were saying about actually it's quite basic it's it's that's a thing and that's a thing of interest and there are things to know about this and i think with human milk it, it can get quite complex but it, you know we really try and boil it down to the most simple i always say to the, to the scientists or somebody just talk to me like i'm eight because i don't know i don't know enough to you know so we have these quite funny situations where they're talking and i'm going mm, no i didn't i didn't understand any of that <laughs> <laughs> so but but it just you know it can actually be really really simple and once you once you know it you, you don't unknow it you know just send people to the website or whatever you don't have to memorize any of it but getting that i i felt again that kind of surge of of of, of um um grief i think it is grief more than anything else grieving that an image like sunbloom would be considered inappropriate when those are the images we need and we need we need lots of them around it and, and it is 
again, echo echoing what you said about you feel that what you do is actually very basic and very simple. And in some ways it, well, it's, it's primal. It is, it's just, mm -hmm. and that it, yeah. Yeah, I, I completely agree that we need to see more of those images. Uh, so I'm, I'm still shocked about this Sunbloom image and the censoring and what's going on. Why are some things censored and some things not? Is it, does it have to do with skin color? Does it have to do with location on the planet? Like what's going on? And I'm sure you have one. the, I'd love to hear. So Sunbloom came about because we wanted to um, advertise the scarves, get them out to more people. The way the algorithm works now as well is that unless you boost your posts as a business, you don't even reach the people who like your page. You know, it's um, you kind of have to pay to reach people now. That's kind of the the, the, the business model. Yeah. So it got flagged in, and also the shop. We have a shop where um, it's kind of connected with Shopify and it's all kind of interlinked. And so automatically when we upload new products in our shop, they get, they come onto the shop on Facebook. So it was flagged there as well. Mm -hmm. uh, as as um you know content that we couldn't put in the shop and it was flagged as content that couldn't be boosted or advertised so that's where I realized that oh we still have a problem mm -hmm. and got into the conversation about so I originally thought oh, it's a mistake it's it's just the algorithm is going to be fine you know we'll just I'll appeal it, it'll be fine you know so it was really quite quite a surprise to get the um, information back of like no 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 that wasn't a mistake this is inappropriate and then I kind of went into I, I, I need to get into a conversation with somebody about this because this is what is this so that's that's where the difference is so whereas we all go around thinking yeah this is fine now mm. and of course you can go if you're on Facebook you you could come across those images because you explore but it can't be advertised to you it can't come up in a post Mm. that is um, targeting you to see something so mm -hmm. it was a case of okay so that mentality is still there also the wording of it the sexually provocative adult content really bugged me mm -hmm. um, I, I just thought no no not not in any shape or form and it, it, it just dawned on me that the, it was this, just the same mindset again I just thought wow here we are again so Chloe, for example, has never been able to advertise her paintings. She gets blocked all the time. Mm. Um, so I thought, you know, this, this campaign is, it's not an anti-Facebook campaign by any stretch. Um, I really like Facebook as a tool. I love it. I use it to stay in touch with friends. I think I'd, I'd be, honestly, I think I'd be in a worse place in my life without that facility to stay in touch. And to, mm -hmm. it's where the project started. It's how people came to know the information. It's a, I think it's one, it's, I think it's a fantastic tool. So it's not, we're not on a mission to take anybody down. You know, that's kind of not how we roll anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but it's say, okay, so if you won't speak to me and if you won't allow this, then we're gonna think something up we're gonna you know it's, it's sort of like a bit of a megaphone of like well i know it's a great big wall out there i wonder, I wonder who owns that wall you know kind of um um because because it's a culture that needs to change i you know small gestures like okay yes you can post your image of breastfeeding if you want to and that is a positive step i'm not saying it's not it is but the culture remains that at the bottom line is that, yeah, but we still don't think it's appropriate. Like we'll let you do it under certain circumstances, but we still won't, we still don't believe that it is um, worthy of just being uh, imagery that, that is free for people to see. Because also just, it's a great starting point because it raises, it raises the issue. It raises the, the issue of how much we have to hide ourselves, how much women are putting themselves second, putting our own needs second, constantly and how much that is actually required of us really um so it was more of a it's a starting point rather than a sort of end game if you like mm -hmm. it's exciting no I mean I I think it's the images of Sunbloom is just so beautiful Chloe, Chloe's artwork is incredible and um to see that on a grand scale 
Um, and then to, to, to know the ripple effect that that could have is just so exciting. Um, so yeah. I'm really, yeah, really happy to support this in any way I can and, and to get out on the megaphone with you guys and <laughs> make some noise. Yeah, amazing. So you, you're actually coming over, right? If we can get this, this mural off the ground, which quick shout out to the fact that we do have to raise the funds for this. So the, you know, the clothing brand is, it's, it's doing fine, but it's a startup and it's not, you know, no, we're not getting paid. I'm not getting, I haven't been, I haven't been paid in eight years. Like I don't get paid anything for all the work at Human Milk. So it's, um, you know, any, any money that's there covers the overheads, it covers the translations, the design work, etc. So our suppliers all get paid, but you know, none of us lot do. So it's, um, uh, it's not something that we can finance ourselves but we will be obviously putting a lot into it. But um, the plan is to get that sorted and you'll be coming over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm so excited. Yeah, I wanted to, um, yeah, I haven't booked my ticket yet, but I'm, I'm, I'm on it. So yeah. can't wait to meet you in person and the other people on the team and see this beautiful image unfold in front of our eyes. And I think there's, even in the witnessing of that, there's a lot of strength and empowerment. Um, so I can't wait. Um, just going back to having the conversations and talking about it more. I, I also see in my one-on-one -on -one experience with families, how powerful the partner, how powerful the role the partner plays. Mm -hmm. and, and part of me would actually love for there to be some male voices like some father figures showing up and yeah you know wouldn't it be interesting to hear an uncensored something from some dad who's just so passionate about it and but also like no big deal you know it's like yeah breasts are produce breast milk they feed babies they also can do these other things potentially but like <laughs> Um, I just, I've just seen it make, I, I, I often have honed this. I feel like I've kind of honed this skill in my practice now. Like I can just see these couples who are a team, you know, it's so obvious that that dad is pretty much just as de dedicated to their child being breastfed as the mom is. And, and there's so much strength in that, like beauty and love, but also so much strength. And that mom, you know, is going to do her best and it, even if that doesn't mean she makes a full milk supply for her baby, it's, it's, it's okay. They're like doing it as a team. There's something about the couple coming together on this journey of feeding their baby that is so beautiful to witness. And I just, I just want to hug all the dads in my clinic who act I'm just like, bless your heart. You know, like it's so beautiful to see them care so much about breastfeeding yeah their infants well-being and and their partners you know their partner's well-being too physically and also mentally and emotionally yeah um, love it. yeah mm -hmm. yeah that was you when 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 um uh, when the ad was was shot the sort of human milk tiny of tiny humans ad was shot like seven years ago whenever it was um and on the day there were about 120 people booked to come um and about I think 22 families or something and um, I had we had invited sort of you know bring your partner bring your mother bring whoever you want you know kind of come together and we'll so that we can interview people and talk to people as well mm -hmm. and I had this idea that the, the women would be back to back on this rotating stage and that there would be this kind of partnership between them the the, the mothers um and and during the first like the first set of women together on the stage just just off camera were the two dads and I've got I've got a photograph of them they were just watching and they were like and their faces were so lit up and they were so proud and they were just like wow this is so cool and I just went hang on a minute wait what am I doing no wait go go up go up be with them show show me that on camera like what am I doing why did I and that was that kind of evolution in the moment that I just thought oh my god I've never seen a team like this Mm -hmm. I've not witnessed this so I wasn't able to imagine it in advance of the filming because it, it just wasn't a thing in my head because you hadn't experienced it yourself or because 
Um, yeah. Well, I, I had. I mean, Neil's always been super supportive and, and you know, thinks it's just the most normal, mm. brilliant thing in the world. So I'm sure I'll rope him in at some point to be on camera. But um, but I, I don't know. It was just the imagery. I'd only ever seen mothers on their own, really. And I don't even know where or, mm. you know. So again, the importance of imagery. And... And Sun Bloom is on her own. She's she's on her own on on the in the image, mm -hmm. which is kind of why I want all of these other conversations, all of these other things to happen around it as well, because she's a sort of symbol for all of us. She's a symbol of all of us, mm -hmm. and she's not on her own at all. And I don't want her to be up there on her own. You know, it's like, oh yeah, we're all there as well. And so this is part of it, and kind of part of why the film. I really passionately want the film to happen as well. Mm -hmm. because it really is a call to all of us together she's really not on her own she's got a massive team around her mm -hmm. um so it's that's the symbolism you know part of the symbolism of the film itself and also we're going to be stopping people on the streets all day Love every it. day of the paint we're going to be showing them a picture of the finished thing and say this is what we're painting what yeah. do you think what do you you know and I, I I'm I'm gonna um I got some leaflets today I'm gonna go and distribute them around Bristol I'm gonna show people a picture and I'm just gonna say do you mind if I like on my iPhone can I just film your reaction when I tell you that this is the image that got banned right okay here it is and I want to see faces you know I want to see them go oh <laughs> or on one you know just like little moments of people going what the f yeah <laughs> just not yeah because um so yeah, I kind of lost the thread slightly, but yeah, it was just the fact of not having seen, mm. um, I hadn't imagined. I mean, I was very, very alone in the first like year of Ellie's life. And it, yeah, I guess I just projected my own experience onto what this thing was going to look like. And before, like it, before the day was up, like everyone had come on, the, they were all on the platform together. Some of the footage was unusable because there were so many people on it. <laughs> you know and the siblings picking their nose and yeah every <laughs> <day> like... <laughs> it's all happening yeah so. <laughs> is there anything is there anything else you you want to is there anything you want to add not that i can think of right now no we covered lots and it was really really lovely to to connect and to feel the passion with you claire and and to to share it you know i do think yeah we have connected obviously for a reason and um i'm excited to see the unfolding and what what happens next yeah. to support you amazing thank you so much it's been great to talk to you and I, I i'm sure there's much more to talk about um and when you come over we will we will have some fun that sounds <laughs> great can't yeah. wait <laughs> thank you for listening we hope you enjoyed this conversation over the coming weeks, we'll be sharing many more conversations with you. If you'd like to know more about the project and contribute to making it happen, please visit crowdfunder.co.uk forward slash the motherhood mural. We need your help to make it all happen. Thank you. <laughs>